There you go. That could do it. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, please open to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, starting in verse 1 and reading through verse 1 and 2. Hear God's holy word. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. Lord, I pray, God, that you would be here with us. I pray, Lord, that uh, as we talk about a very in-depth issue, uh, an issue, Lord, that uh, good Christians of all varieties disagree on, I pray, Lord, you'd give us an extra measure of grace. Give me a measure of grace today. Please fill me with the Spirit and dwell me with the Spirit, Lord, that I might not preach anything that's wrong or contrary to your word. I pray for the people that they would judge all things and weigh all things by your word, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would just fill each one of us today. Help us to renew our commitment to you at this time. I pray, Lord, this would be a blessed time for us to study Uh, this matter of your cross and what it means and what it doesn't mean, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would surround us and protect us by your spirit and by your holy angels, that you would uh, rid uh, this place of any demonic influence. I pray, God, that you would just by your blood and by your power of your blood and by your, your spirit and the presence of your angels surround us, wipe away all sleepiness from our minds and our eyes, Uh, all distraction, Lord, so that we might focus in and get to uh, what it is that you have for us today, Lord, Mm -hmm. on this important matter of the cross. So, Lord, we ask this, we lift this up to you, we say this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, there were five preachers, and uh, they wanted to know who was the best preacher out of the five. There was a Catholic priest, a... um, a Lutheran, a Baptist, a, a, a Reformed Baptist, a Pentecostal, and an army chaplain. And they all chose the text. Now this, this kind of sounds like a joke, and it kind of is, but it's more of an illustration than anything. But they all chose the text about David conquering Goliath. And they said, we're going to see who is the best preacher and so the catholic priest gets up and he explains things and at the very end he says and david chose five smooth stones and of course those five smooth stones stand for the holy catholic church the true priesthood (laughs) the uh the true baptism of the holy catholic church the true communion and the true prayers to mary they are what conquer all the giants in your life and if you'll just hunker in on those you will conquer any giant that's before you and then the Uh, Lutheran got up there and he said, you are all wrong. That is not what the five stones stand for. The five stones stand for the five wounds of Christ, his, his, the nails in his feet, uh, and then the two nails in his hand, the, the spear in his side, the, did I, no, no, the spear in his side, and then the, the uh, crown of thorns on his head the five wounds of Christ, that is what will slay every giant before you. And then the Reformed Baptist or the Presbyterian got up and said, you're all wrong. Obviously, the five smooth stones stand for the five points of Calvinism, <laughs> total depravity, limited, or total, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And if you keep those in your mind, you'll be able to slay any 
mighty giants that are before you. And then the, uh, the, uh, the Pentecostal got up. He says, you guys are all wrong. That's not what slays. This stands, the five smooth stones stands for the five fold ministry of the Holy Spirit. It stands for the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the, um, the teacher, the, the, the pastor, the teacher, and the, and the evangelist. And then the army chaplain gets up and he says, you're all wrong. We all know that this stands for the Pentagon. And what okay. keeps America safe is the Pentagon. And the five smooth stones stands for the five branches of the military. Well, the illustration is simply this. Preachers have the tendency of overcomplicating things at times. They have the tendency to overcomplicate things. I included have the tendency to overcomplicate things. However, we do have to understand that there are issues in the Bible which are not simple in themselves. That we don't want to overcomplicate anything. But at the same time, we don't want to simplify things that are more simple than the Bible actually talks about. There are issues, for example, like the issue of the Trinity. And when you're talking about the Trinity and when you say, okay, we've established the Trinity, Jesus Christ is God. And then you, you, know, you explain the Trinity, what it means, what it doesn't mean. But then you get to a verse where Jesus says something like, I don't know when my return is. Only not even the angels in heaven. Only the Father knows. And you have to say from it, you say, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? You see, you have to bring some light from the entire Bible on that passage and talk about what that passage means in light of the entire Bible. Now, I'm not going to explain that to you at this point. A lot of times that's re resolved in the idea that there are um, verses which appeal to Christ's humanity and verses which appeal to Christ's divinity. But this is one of those verses, especially for those of us who are Calvinists. When we read this, because we've been trained in the five points of Calvinism, particularly in the L of limited atonement, and we read a verse like this, we want to know, well, what's he saying here? What's this mean? Is this a compromise for what we call limited atonement in Calvinism? Because it seems like it is. It seems like what he's saying here contradicts what we've learned elsewhere, okay? Now, my issue here is not to complicate this, but to explain what's happening. Because John means something here. He doesn't mean nothing, okay? Every verse means something. He's not saying nothing here. But what does he mean when he says these words? He says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, we are all on board with that. But what troubles us as Calvinists is this verse 2. It's verse 2. It says, he is the propitiation of our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So let me take a step back here and kind of explain the difference between Arminianism, Calvinism, and hyper-Calvinism. So you're going to have to forgive me for a moment. We're going to go, I've analogized before that uh, the difference between the Sunday school room and the preaching room is the difference between eating a meal and learning how to cook. Okay, so when you come on Tuesday nights or you come to the Sunday school or something like that, you're learning how to cook. Okay, now you eat as you're learning how to cook, but you're, you're, you're getting into depth. You're talking about concepts of cooking. You're talking about, you know, uh, uh, how to chop food and how to steam it and how to fry it and all that stuff. Those are more high level concepts that you learn in the cooking school. But the, the sermon is the, 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 the feeding of the meal. That's the serving of the meal. That's what the sermon is. Now, occasionally in sermons, things come up like this where I have to say, look, we're going to go into the kitchen for a minute, okay? So everybody buckle up here for just a minute, take a deep breath, and we're going to think about this issue because I'm going to explain some things to you as though we were going into the kitchen and learning how to cook this meal. There are three basic positions when it comes to the cross. Now, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the cross. There's what's called the Arminian position. There's the Calvinist position. And then there's the hyper-Calvinist position. Now, there's, those are your three basics. Now, Arminianism is the idea 
that Christ and God intended and wanted to save all men and that Christ died equally for all men and that the only difference in the cross between someone who's saved and someone who's lost is the faith that that person has. It's designed to save everybody. It's intended to save everybody. That's the Arminian position. There's no difference between you and the non-elect in the cross because for them, everything revolves around the freedom of the will. Everything revolves, and they don't believe in election the way a Calvinist believes in election. Now there are what's called four point Calvinists. They generally are, you know, they come out of Dallas Seminary. A lot of dispensationals who are also Calvinists tend to be four point Calvinists. Uh, Dallas Seminary is a hotbed for that. They're, they come out, they come out four point Calvinists. But they believe that yes, God elected from the foundation of the earth. You can't, you don't have the ability within yourself to choose. You have to be born again before you can make that choice. Your, your uh, salvation is secure, but they will say that the work of the cross is equal toward all men, that God desires all people to, to be saved, and that in the atonement, not only is he provided a way for all people to be saved, but the atonement by itself doesn't do anything different for the believer as it does for the unbeliever, for the elect and the non-elect. It's the same for each person. It's the same. Now, that's a four-point Calvinist. The Calvinists are run by this motto. All Calvinists, low and high Calvinists, are run by this motto, okay? This is the motto I want you to understand. That the cross is sufficient for all men, but efficient for the elect only. Mm -hmm. The cross is sufficient for all, but efficient for all, but efficient for the elect only. Now, in Calvinism, you have a distinction between lower Calvinists and higher Calvinists. Now, what do I mean by that, lower Calvinist and higher Calvinist? Well, in high Calvinism, you have people like um, John Owen, who would say that he believes in the sufficiency of the cross for all men, but the efficiency for only the elect. But the way he starts to describe it, really, it, you can't hold that consistently. You can't hold that consistently. And for people like Francis Turretin and Theodore Beza, there were some people who got really high in their Calvinism, and they said they would say, "Yes, the cross is sufficient to save any to save everybody. It's e but it's only efficient to save the elect." But when you started exploring that. They seem to be not on purpose, but, but creating a tension that wasn't really quite there. So let me give you an example of this. If I said to you, if I said to you, like you're all poisoned, right? You know, you're at dinner and I poisoned you all. You're, you're all going to die. And I say to you, and I have the dose of poison here, and I say, this poison is sufficient enough to save everybody, but I really only bought, brought enough for me and my wife. Am I, am I, and I offer it to you, but there's really only two doses in it. You see, there's a little bit of an inconsistency. I can't genuinely say that it is sufficient for everybody. It's not. It's, if I only have enough for me, and if I only have enough for me, and I don't have enough for everybody else, I, I can say it's sufficient for all, but efficient for only the elect. But I don't really mean that. You see, there's it's some it's somewhat of a not a lie per se, but it's just inconsistent to say that. How can it be that it's sufficient for everybody, but I don't have enough for everybody? You see, so a, a high a, that's what high Calvinists kind of get themselves. They bind themselves into that. A low Calvinist, such as myself, I'm a lower on in my Calvinism. I'm still a five-point Calvinist. Don't misunderstand me. I'm going to explain this in a minute. But you see, a low Calvinist says that it's sufficient for everybody. It's efficient for only the elect because of the nature of the atonement, because of the nature of who Christ is. See, he has so much value in himself that the intention is only for the elect the efficiency is only for the elect, but, the, but you can't put a, a limit on the value. You can't put a limit on the value. So 
Uh, I, so th it's been analogized this way, and the people that I follow in this are not, are not like there's a group of people, Francis Turt and Theodore Beza and, and John Owen, who I think were a little too high. If you look at, Will, if you look at Shedd, uh, William Shedd, I think that was his name, and um, Charles Hodge. If you look at those people, they have a, I think they have a better understanding of the atonement. To a degree, a guy named Moshe Amaro also has a better view of the atonement, if you want to go back and look at those, those people. And they would say it's something like this. And I'm going to analogize this, and I'm going to seek to justify this analogy, okay? Biblically, I'm going to seek to justify this analogy. And that is, if I, I go into the store and I want to buy the paper, but my intention in the, in the paper is only for the sports page. That's the only thing. I mean, Well, for me, it'd be the funnies. That's it. I mean, I'm not, not the sports, think the business. No, no, the, the business. No, I'm not interested in the business page. I'm interested in the funnies. Now, I have to buy the entire paper. I'm limited in my intention. I'm limited in what I want out of it, but the price of the whole thing has to be paid. Now, after I pay the price for the whole thing, I then have the right to throw the rest in the trash and keep what I want out of it. So I believe it's limited. I believe it's limited in its intent. I believe that it's limited in what it actually does, but I don't necessarily believe it's limited in its in the fact that Jesus could only pay for part of sins of the world, could pay, pay for part. Now, the high Calvinists, you see, the problem is, is they analogize this to money. And if you have this money analogy, which the Bible does use, you can push it too far. Because if they look at it like this, if, if Christ paid for all the sins of all the people, and this is what John Owen wrote in his book, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. If Christ paid for all the sins of all the people, then all people should go to heaven. If he paid for all your sins, then everybody should go to heaven because what's keeping you out? Well, you would say unbelief, but you see unbelief is a sin. And, and, but if he paid for all your sins, then he paid for your unbelief as well. So why is that keeping you out of heaven? This is a very logical argument. The problem with it is it's using payment in a money analogy. You see, like if you owe money on your house, I can go and I can provide legal tender for that money and they have, or for that house, for that debt. And you have to take that, that, that money. And the Bible analogizes the, the concept of money, forgive us our, sin, our debts as we forgive our debtors, a payment is made. Here's the problem. That's an analogy that could be pushed too far. You don't owe God money. You've offended God. God is an offended being. And he can make an offering for a limited few that secures them. But the offering for a limited few can be good enough for everybody. Okay, it can be good enough for everybody. You don't owe God money. It's not like you owe him five bucks and I go and I pay him five bucks. And, well, he can't get it out of you because he already got it out of me. Okay, so that's not that, that that's taking the analogy of scripture and going too far with it. And that drives people into hyper Calvinism. Hyper Calvinism is the belief. Well, one aspect of hyper Calvinism is the belief that if Christ wanted to buy one more sinner, he'd have to pay a little bit more, actually. Yeah. So it's almost like a one-for-one, one, like you'd have to bleed a little bit more. And you see, this money analogy actually pushes people into hyper-Calvinism, because if belief didn't separate you before, because he paid for all your sins, including your unbelief, then you are saved before you believed. See, it's, it's, a, it's a logical conclusion. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that's right, but logically... If Christ died for all your sins, including your unbelief, then he was never mad at you. He was never wrathful to you in your unbelief. You see, because he paid for it. He paid for it on the cross. He paid for all your sins. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God was just as mad at you as he was at the non-elect. The difference is, is that he had a special love for you as well that secured your redemption. So in what ways are, does the Bible teach that Christ is limited in this atonement, but it's good enough for everybody? Why? Let me, let me try to justify that. Then at the very end, I'm going to give another last analogy. Number one, I want to say this. 
Christ's interaction as high priest is limited. Christ's interaction as high priest is limited to the elect only. In other words, he steps in and provides atonement for a certain amount of people. Turn to John chapter 17. And this is his high priestly prayer. Of course, I can't go through everything about this prayer right now, but I do want you to see that Christ definitely sets the world in two phases, his elect and those who aren't his elect. And he says, I'm going to secure for the elect only. He says not for a certain group of people. This is one of the only places where he says, I'm not doing it for them. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is coming. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Okay, so this is what he wants to do. He wants to give eternal life to all those who have given him. Now skip down to verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Okay, so who's he praying for? He's praying for people you gave them out of the world. Since you have given me authority over all flesh to give eternal life to whom you have given me. There is a group of people who were given to the Son. In verse 6, six it says, I have manifest your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. Now look at verse 9. It says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me out of the world. This is one of the places where he, said he lumps a group of people into people he is not praying for. He says, I am not praying for them. I am praying for these people you've given me. Now, why is he praying for them? Now, you got to understand, this is a reflection of what happened in the Old Covenant when the high priest, in his prayer, would go into the Holy of Holies bearing the 12 stones on his breastplate representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And when he slaughtered the goat and made the propitiation, then he took the other goat off and threw it off a cliff in the expiation, he wasn't doing it for the Egyptians. He was doing it for Israel. He didn't go in there with the blood of the goat for the, for the Egyptians. He didn't do it for the rest of the Canaanites. He didn't do it for the, he didn't do it for the, 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 any other name you want to put there. But he says, I am praying for them. I, I am not praying for the world. Now look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. So we understand he sets this, these two camps up. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world and for their sake. Now, who's the there? We understand the there is the elect, not the world. For them, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in truth. In other words, what he's saying here is I'm setting myself apart for this group and not this group. What's he setting himself apart for? To die. He's setting himself apart to die. So in other words, Christ's intercession as high priest and his act as high priest is not for everybody who ever existed. It's, as a matter of fact, he specifically says, there's a group of people I'm not doing this for. I am only acting as high priest for the new Israel for the new Israel of God. He's setting himself apart. He's consecrating himself. Some of your versions might say sanctifying himself. What's he sanctifying himself for? He's setting himself apart to die. That's what he's going to the cross to do. And in verse 20, it says, I do not ask for these only, but for those who, uh, who you will give me, um, 
through their word. So he is sanctifying himself. He is setting himself apart to die, not for one group, but for another group. Okay. So in his high priestly action, he is limited. He does not act as high priest for everybody who ever existed past present and future. I just, I, I just don't see any other way to read this. He is the high priest of the elect only. He's the high priest of the new Israel. Just like in the Old Testament, the high priest was for physical Israel. He's the high priest of true spiritual Israel. So he's the high priest for them only. Now here's the analogy. I want to give another analogy and seek to um, justify it. It's one I've given before, but bear with me, okay? You have two children. They both throw rocks at a car window. It's your window. Let's pretend you have two children. They throw rocks. They both, they break. You have one child and another. Now the parent comes of one of the child, one of the children, sorry, and says, look, look, let's work something out here. Let's say the, 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 uh, the window cost a thousand bucks and a thousand bucks. I can't just throw money at that person. I can't just go, well, there's a thousand bucks. That should cover it. See you later. Because he's not, it's not just a matter of money. He's an offended party. He could say, I ain't taking your money. I'm going to call the cops right now. doesn't matter that your money is able to pay for my window. I'm an offended party. Take your money home. I'm calling the police. He could do that. That's one situation that he could do. But now you have one parent who comes in and he's only stepping in for his child. He's not stepping in for the other child. He's stepping in for only his child. He says, let's work something out here. And he said, the guy sits there and he thinks, okay, well, let's see. The window is 500 bucks. I'm gonna have to get a tow car or whatever. I'm gonna take it down. Does he, does the, would the guy say, well, okay, 50% of what I have to do is going to go, is going to be 500 bucks. So if you pay me 500 bucks, I won't call it. Or does the owner want the whole thing repaired? He wants the whole thing repaired. It doesn't matter who did it. He wants the whole thing repaired. He's got, he got to accept payment for the whole thing. But if he accepts payment for the whole thing, he can rightly at that point, because that person has an, interse an intercessor, say for you, because you paid me this, I'm going to take that money. I'm not going to call the police, but he can rightly also still call the police on the other child because he has no intercessor. Even though the window's paid for, this person didn't interact on his behalf. That person is still an offense to him. Now, here's the other thing the person can do. He could say something like, look, just say you're sorry. Just say you're sorry. He has no intercessor. The person intercessed for only, the, for only his son. But, the other, but you could offer it to him. So look, the, the offense is paid. Say you're sorry. You see how it can be offered equally to both people, but the intercessor and the payment is made to, because of only one. So the offering can be for everybody, but the intercessor can be only one. He only intercedes for the elect. He only pays in the sense that it accomplishes and secures redemption for only the elect, but it is good enough. Now, what if the guy said, look, I want to pay this car for you, and the only thing that I have is a German 16th century gold ducat. Okay, that's all I've got is a 16th century gold ducat. Now, I don't know how much you know uh, is worth a 16th century gold, but that would pay his car. He's like, hey, let's, let's say I'd pay, if I'd pay for all of it. I'd get all of it. Yeah, sure, go ahead, take it. Take the whole car. You've paid for all of it. You see, when you're dealing with the death of Christ, you can't limit it in its value because he's an eternal being. When you strike Christ, you strike into eternity. This is why he was able to suffer only three and a half hours on the cross, but suffer eternal hell for his elect. He was able to suffer his etern eternal hell for his, for his elect in three and a half hours, because when you strike into him, you strike into eternity. We see this even in modern examples. The more important the person is, the 
the, 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 the more value his death is in our society. So how many streets have, there's a lot of people who died when Martin Luther King died. Mm -hmm. Lots of people died that day. A cop died that day, in fact. Mm -hmm. But do we have that cop's name anywhere on any street? No, because he, he's more important. He was more valuable. People remember him more. People honor him more. There's more value in the atonement because when you strike Christ, you're striking into eternity. He's only high priest. He doesn't do that for all. He does it for many. I want to show you a couple with this in mind. Keep that in mind. Now look at a couple verses here. Turn to um, Matthew chapter 20. In verse 28, it says, Even as the Son of Man came not to serve, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, it doesn't say all here. Now, I understand that in logic, many can be a subset of all. We, we get that. But you understand here, in light of Christ's high priestly prayer, many is not in, in contrast to all. Many is in contrast to others. He's saying, I'm giving my life as a ransom for many. The other problem that you have here is that it's a ransom that's given. When a ransom is given, those who are ransomed must be paid back for justice to be done. If somebody kidnapped your kid and you paid the ransom, you pay it, ex not hoping, but expecting that that person's going to honor that ransom. God doesn't, God doesn't uh, play unfair. Okay, God doesn't play unfair. He ran, if you pay a ransom to God, whatever is ransom must be given back. Turn to, um, turn to uh, sorry, uh, Matthew chapter 26. And also in verse 28. says, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Remember, read this in light of John chapter 17. Who's the many? The many isn't a subset of all. It's many as opposed to others. He poured out his sins. He poured out his blood for the sins of many. All right. Now, not only is it limited in what in in Christ's high priestly interaction, but it's also limited in intention. Turn to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. And verse, see, this is, this is stated purpose of Jesus Christ's life. Stated purpose of Jesus Christ's life is given here in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. This is the intention in which he came to, uh, to live his life. It says in verse 21, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he's going to try to save some people if they will put their trust in him from their sins because he did it for everybody and it's, he pays for everybody's sins. And it's not what it says. It says, he will bear a son, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So it's limited to the elect in its high priestly function. It's limited to the elect in its purpose, and it's also limited to the elect in its effectiveness. In other words, the atonement does something for the elect that it doesn't do for other people. It does something for the elect that it doesn't do for other people. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. It 
says, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of, his, uh, of, of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, securing an eternal redemption for the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the defiled per, uh, persons with its assage, asses and heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve God. He secured eternal redemption. He didn't make it possible. He didn't just simply make it available. He secured it. Well, who did he secure it for? He didn't secure it for himself. He didn't need that. He secured it for you. The term all, when it says he entered once for all, that's a statement of finality. That's not a statement of everybody and that's like if i say i'm going to take care of the weeds once for all i don't mean i'm doing it for everybody who ever existed i mean it's a statement of finality and look in light of that look at verse 28 so christ having been offered to bear the sins of many now remember the many is opposed to all it actually accomplishes something well the Arminian will fire back on all this and say, yeah, but the Bible does say that, the, that he died for all people. Uh, 2 Peter 2.2, 2, the verse we started this off with, John 2, 1 John 2.2, 2, uh, 1 Timothy 2.6, Hebrews 2.6, all talk about the universal aspect of the atonement. And I want to say one thing here. There is a sense of the universal aspect of the atonement, as I've said already. However, let me just say this. Some of these verses don't teach what they think that it means. So when he says all men, let me just say this. When he says he died for all men, I'm going to tell you that all men means all of a category. Now, why would I say that? Stick with me here, okay? Please stick with me on a couple of things here. It's 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 14. This is a very important verse, by the way, for your Arminian friends. When somebody wants to say all means all and that's all all means, well, every once in a while it's qualified. In verse 14, it says, Therefore I swore to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So when Christ died, I know this, he didn't die for Eli. He didn't die for Eli's house. This is one of those places where the revealed will of God and the, and the secret will of God is unveiled and you look back behind the curtain and cry and Jesus says here, or the father says here to Samuel, I am not going to pay for Eli's house. When Christ went to the cross, he didn't pay for his sins. Eli wasn't in heaven. His sons weren't in heaven thinking, oh, I can't wait till the redemption. He says, no, at least not in a propitiatory way, at least not in a way that turns away wrath, at least not in the way of a high priest. He didn't die for those things. He did not die for Eli's sins. He says, no sacrifice will be offered forever for his sins. So this idea that Christ died for all the sins that ever existed of all the people past, present, and future is just based on biblical illiteracy. He didn't die for all people's sins. The second thing I want you to see about Christ's death is that the term all means all of a category or all kinds of people. Turn to John chapter 12 and verse 32. I'm going, to, I'm going to anticipate a couple of objections here, so I'm going to try to get ahead of a couple things here on this. 
But look here in verse 32 of uh, John chapter 12, it says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. So one idea here is that, well, Jesus is drawing everybody. He's enticing everybody. And, and then it's up to you to respond. Okay, so that's not what's being said here. The word draw in English, unfortunately, has two meanings. It has like kind of this wooing aspect, like I, I drew this person into this. Uh, in, in Greek, it doesn't have that meaning at all. And in English, it doesn't have that meaning. That same word draw is the same word where, it, where it's translated haul, as in to haul the nets. And it's also translated draw as in when they drew, when they drew uh, Paul and Silas into prison. And it's also used that way in English. When I say I drew my gun, does that mean, here gun, come on, into my hand, let's go. Or does that mean when I draw my gun, I actually put my hand on it and I pull the gun out? That's what drawing means. If I say I drew water from a well, does that mean I stood at the top of the well and said, here water, water, come up? No, I, I'm not enticing water to come up. The word draw means I put the, the, the bucket down and I drew the water up. If I draw my sword, I put my hand on it and I pull the sword out. That's what the term draw means. And it means that in the Greek, like I said, when they took Paul and Silas into prison and it uses that same word, they drew him into prison. They weren't saying, hey, Paul, Silas, come on, let's go into prison. You know, this is where you really want to be. This is where you want to be at. Listen, no, that means they put their hands on them and they pulled them into prison. When they pulled the nets, when they pulled the nets out of the water into the boat that had the fish in it, it uses the same word. They drew it in. So when it says draw, he's not enticing. He says, I will draw all men to myself. Now, what does he mean here? So if drawing means putting your hand on something and pulling it in by an external force, and he says, I drew all men to myself, then does that mean every single person who ever lived is going to be saved? No. He means all kinds of people there. All men for them in that day meant not just Jews men's Gentiles as well. That's what would be shocking to them. You're telling me that not just Jews are going to be drawn, but all people are going to be drawn? It's all in the sense of a set. So if I say, hey guys, look, we're going to have a banquet in here. I need you to get all the chairs and move them into the other room. Do I mean all the chairs in the whole world? Or do you understand that in the context when I say move all the chairs, I mean move all the chairs here into the other room? move all the chairs into the other room. It's the same sense in which he's using here. He draws all men. Yes, he draws all kinds of men to himself, not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. In 2 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, they deny the Lord who bought them. I don't deny that at all. He denied, they, 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 they talk about the, these people denied the Lord who bought them. Christ bought them for sure, but he didn't buy them to save them. He bought them so that he can rightly, as the second Adam, send them to hell. Just like when I pick up the whole paper, and I pick up the whole, I buy the whole paper, but my intention in the whole paper is not to, is not to have every bit of the paper. I crumple the rest of, my buying the paper gives me the right to throw the rest in the trash. Now, of course, he had the right already as God, but you got to remember, he comes as the second Adam, right? He comes as the second Adam in the sense that he's now the new head of humanity. He's the new head of humanity. I'm almost done. I don't know if you're leaving or not, but he's the new head of humanity, okay? And in the new head of humanity, he's the new king. And as the new king, he has the right to say, you're done, you're coming with me. You're done, you're coming with me. So when we get over to 1 John chapter, there's been a few ways that people have tried to deal with, Calvinists have tried to deal with this. Let me just tell you the way that I deal with this um, as well. But I really wanted to establish that as high priest, as intercessor, as effectiveness, and there's many more verses that I could get to. When he says here, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, the righteous, he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. I believe that. 
I believe his offer for salvation is good enough for anybody. I really do. Now, some people will say whole world means means Jews and Gentiles. I get that. There have been different ways that Calvinists have tried to deal with that. I, I'm not. I'm not necessarily in that camp. Right here, I think that he. What being what's being said here is this offering is good enough for anybody, and it is. I can take one son and intercede for him and secure his salvation. And I can look at the other person and say, why go to hell? It's been paid for. It's good enough for you. I can legitimately secure the salvation of the elect for one and legitimately offer salvation for the other. I can legitimately secure the salvation for one and legitimately offer the salvation to the other. I don't think, I'm sorry, but I don't think high Calvinists can do that. I don't think hyper Calvinists can't for sure. And I think Arminians just don't get it. They don't miss the point. Christ did not act as intercessor for all people. He didn't. But I can offer it to all people. I can totally offer it to all people. I can say to that person, why go to hell? It's, 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 been, it's been paid for. It's been paid for. Don't go to hell, please. By all means, but I can also say that Christ only secured the salvation for the elect. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for this, Lord. I, these are our, our touchy subjects, I know, Lord, and we all have to settle these things in our own mind. And I pray, Lord, that we would take the total of biblical evidence and bring it to bear on every verse of the Bible. So we ask this, and we ask, Lord, that you would just settle this in our hearts and our minds um, and help us to understand that there is tension, there is mystery in the Bible. We're not going to be able to figure all things out. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if each one of you want to come up and take the cup and this, and I'm, I am moving toward uh, doing this on a weekly basis. We'll talk about that maybe some other time. But, um,